Well, well. Hello, hello. Welcome to Gats TV. Uh, we're the channel of idiots formerly known as the Gorilla Review. I know it's been a long time since we've had a long form video. Um, and we're working on focusing more of our content on pistol caliber carbines and pistols. Uh, today's video is going to be on some new offerings at a, from TSOS out of Turkey. The uh, Mac 9 DS and the Night Stalker. These are both uh, 2011s um, from TSOS, um, which is a steel frame, not aluminum, with a polymer grip. Um, these are, for all intents and purposes, traditional 2011s. Full disclosure. Um, these guns were provided to us by us. We paid for them ourselves. We paid for the ammo ourselves. We paid for the extra ammo magazines ourselves. Um, nobody helped us. Uh, there was no money or product exchange between us and TSOS or SDS Imports or Military Armor Corporation. Um, so now I'm just going to get right into it. So initial impressions um, on the Mac. I'm going to start with this one because the initial impressions were actually very good. Um, it comes in a box, initially a cardboard box, and you're thinking, is this what I get? And inside the cardboard box is a fancy bag, uh, pretty similar to what you would get with a uh, Staccato or the Stealth Arms Platypus. Um, even, I think Atlas sends out a bag too. I don't have an Atlas, I don't have Atlas money. Um, but it comes in a bag, which is nice. It's got magazine holders in it and a separator in between so you don't get your oops, mags are loaded because I've been carrying this sorry about that guys um, it comes with a little separator so you don't mark the finish in your Mac 9 um, it's got little holders in there like for all intents and purposes it comes with a very nice bag a very nice carrying case exactly what you would expect from a premium handgun um, even though it's at a very sub premium price for a 2011 um, the finish was immaculate until we shot it. We shot, we shot it a lot. The finish is still uh, extremely good, very durable. Um, it's a QPQ, which is salt bath nitride, very similar to what Glock uses on their finishes. Um, uh, it's got no, from the looks of it, after shooting a thousand rounds, it's been in and out of a hol uh, holsters that are retention fit and flight, they and fit uh, based on the retention of the light. The uh, Filster floodlight's not too bad on finishes, but I do have a uh, Safari Land and a, a custom holster for my platypus that this fit in and it wasn't exactly, they were not gentle on the gun and the finish on it is nice. There is a little bit of wear on the uh, rail here from the light, but that's to be expected and that's, you know, that's life. And again, if you've, if you've ever owned a Glock and you see how quickly the finish goes out, not necessarily goes out, but starts to wear off a little bit, um, this is holding up better than any of my Glocks have so far. Um, the Night Stalker is Cerakote, but it's a very nice Cerakote, and just like their single stacks, it's uh, very durable, very high quality. Um, that being said, I definitely prefer the QPQ over Cerakote. Uh, the Stealth Arms Platypus is also Cerakoted, and I wish that they would just offer a QPQ, but this isn't a Stealth Arms Platypus review. Um, this is a review on these guys. and. Um, Again, the, uh, the Cerakote that TSOS uses uh, seems to be durable. We've, we don't have it here for review, but uh, we've shot maybe, what was it, two or 3,000 rounds out of the B9R uh, Duty? Duty and yeah. out of the Night Stalker 10 and, millimeters. Yeah, and we've got a sample size of like five Night Stalker 10 millimeters. That's a long story, but we've got them. They're all good, if you must know. Um, and the Cerakote finish on all of them has been very good. Um, uh, this one doesn't have any issues. It was in a holster as well. Um, it's been drawn. All the marring on it is mostly just built up carbon because this one needs to be. This one got cleaned and this one has not been cleaned yet. Um, but finish is great. Um, just out of the box. Uh, in terms of, again, this is initial impressions. I pulled it out of the box and the spring on the Mac 9DS seems a little bit more aggressive than I would be used to in a 9mm 1911. It's almost Glock 17-like. feels like maybe a 16-pound spring. It's hard to say. I haven't weighed it yet. I haven't messed around with spring weights and I'm not going to. This is just an initial, initial review. Not an even initial review because I put a thousand rounds for both these guns. But um, the it's sprung more aggressively than the um, Night Stalker is. Uh, the Night Stalker came out of the box and it felt very light in comparison to the um, Mac 9. You could, it's clear. If you're gonna be autistic about it, just, just go somewhere else, man. Um, it's way easier to just 
pull it back with the hammer down than it was with the uh, Night Stalker. I mean, with the Mac Nine. Sorry, uh, it still wasn't still wasn't hard, you know. But uh, it did feel more aggressively sprung than the Night Stalker. Just something to keep in mind. Um, I'll get into that in the shooting experience later on in the video. Um, the Night Stalker did have some, still does, even though it has an impeded function. Spoiler alert: guns are reliable. Um, it does have some drag on the disconnector initially. You can hold it with your finger like that. The slide stop is inactivated. Woo! There we go. You can slide stop is inactivated. And of course, this doesn't, as it hasn't impeded the function at all, it's just something to consider when you pick up the gun for the first time and you go, oh, it feels a little. It's a production 1911, not a custom gun. Like, you want to compare it to a Platypus, it's not quite in the same league, which has like no disconnector drag whatsoever. Um, but that is that was there. That was my initial impressions were okay. His impressions as well were you know slight hang. Is is this gonna work? Because we had the Gerson 2311, which turned out to be quite terrible. Not good, I'd say. And it felt we were concerned because oddly similar to this. Initial impressions were well. This has got the same feel as the as the Gerson. This gun was not like the Gerson, and the Gerson is probably one of the worst guns I've ever fired in my entire life. Um, and I've fired some stinkers. Like I'd rather have a high point than the Gerson 2311 that is not 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 being facetious. But yeah, a high point Yeet cannon is probably a better value, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, also, obviously, they both fit um, Surefire X300s, uh, something that the Gerson did not fit, um, despite having a full-length rail. I know that the... Um, TSOS Duty doesn't fit X300s from what I understand. All of them. I mean, I'm pretty sure the thumb screw, the B model fits on the on the Duty. The the carry Duty. Coot? Carry Duty? They have a carry and a Duty. The carry is a four and a quarter. It's got a short rail. doesn't fit an X300 or a TLR1. Evidently. I don't know. And the uh, Duty has a full length rail like the Night Stalker and it fits the X300 of all kinds. Um, in any case, the Gerson 2311 did not fit an X300 in any way, shape, or form. And I'm gonna drop a video for that here. All right, and yeah, but those were our initial impressions. Um, overall fit on the Night Stalker seemed a little bit looser out of the box than the Max, than the Mac, Max, Mac 9. Um, but again, we're talking about production guns, this one being sub $1,000 and this one being right at $1,000. So expectations, to be honest with you guys, were kind of low, despite their single stacks having all been Damn near flaw. Uh, on to slide to frame fit. Um, very good. Uh, the Mac 9 is excellent in the uh, slide to frame fit department. Um, the Night Stalker is good. I wouldn't say it's amazing, but it's what you would expect from a $900 custom, not custom, a $900 production gun. Probably any other, even a production single stack, you probably expect what you're getting out of that Night Stalker DS. Um, the Mac 9 definitely punches above its weight in slide to frame fit. Um, you can tell. Just, I mean, this isn't a test of anything, but the lack of sound it makes, um, moving the the slide back and forth on the frame, the way it feels on the, until you get to the disconnector, which with most production guns, the disconnector is a little wonky, in my opinion. Um, it still feels very smooth, despite having a heavier recoil spring. Um, very nice, the Night Stalker, as I said, uh, very much a, production 1911 just happens to be double stack um it's a little bit on the looser side um you know moving it around is a little easier uh disconnectors as we said before the disconnectors it got a little bit of disconnector hang but not enough to induce any malfunctions um overall acceptable for a production 1911 pretty much what i would expect out of a nine hundred dollar single stack um you're getting out of a nine hundred dollar double stack so uh you know 
Uh, it's about, I'd say, similar to the uh, the Sig Nightmare 1911. Not any different from that gun, which is a lot more, not a lot more expensive, but more expensive. That gun was $1,200? $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $1, $
didn't really have that. If you want to turn it the other way so they can see. What is what? There you go. Well, here we go. They didn't really have that. It was a, you know, your normal amount of take up and then a fairly light trigger and then of course a good reset. They both they both had excellent resets. The Mac 9's reset is ridiculous. Just like very good tactile, um, fast reset. Um at the end of shooting, uh, they both dropped about half a pound in weight in the triggers. Um, we were getting some pulls on this that were under four pounds, which is pretty ridiculous. Uh, and this guy was going in between four and a half to five pounds, settling around the five pound mark. So you, we shaved about a pound off just by shooting. So you can expect that if you were to buy one of these. And um, yeah, uh, I can't really complain too much about the triggers because again these guns are a thousand and nine hundred dollars map or street price respectively so like you're not getting a, a super expensive atlas ignition kit or anything like that out of it um if you know what you're doing with the 2011 or a 19 oh, any 1911 because the parts are almost identical between the two um you can probably make some tuning tuning to the uh, sear spring or the or, or whatnot to, to get it to work right or some of the, the other springs in the gun that's on you. I'm personally not going to do that. Uh, I've spent the last 10 years shooting Glocks for the most part, um, though I've been a 1911 guy almost my entire life. Um, so a uh, five pound 1911 trigger isn't a problem for me and it wasn't a problem shooting accurately or shooting fast. Um, the Night Stalker though, I'll say, it does seem to have a smidge nicer trigger. Um, so between the two, in terms of trigger, I find myself preferring the Night Stalker over the Mac, even though the Mac is still a good trigger. We have a third Mac, or a second Mac, a third sample coming in, and we're going to test all that out with our friend's one that he wanted after he shot this one. Yeah, he shot this one and immediately placed an order with us. So, um, But we're going to gauge that one as well, um, see if there's any differences in quality. A sample of two isn't a lot, but it's still better than a sample of one. And of course, this is a sample of two T-Sauce, and we're going to have a third one in We'll test that and we'll report that, report back. We'll report back after we do a, uh, a long-term evaluation on these, which we are going to do. It shouldn't take long. <laughs> no, it shouldn't take long at all. Um, 500 round burn down. As you can see, the um, 500 round burn down went by without pretty much a hitch. It was larger than eventful. Um, there were three documented malfunctions during the burn down. Um, two with the Mac, one with the Night Stalker. The Mac had one, one stove pipe and one failure to feed, and the Night Stalker had one failure to feed. Um, because we're basically just apes, uh, we didn't read the manual. Surprise, surprise. And as it turns out, there is about a 150 to 300 round break-in period, and both those malfunctions happened within the first couple of magazines. Um, no, mag no issues after that, um, up until after the burn down, when we started testing different kinds of ammo. Um, so we got a stack of ammo here and we talked about it already in the beginning of the video. Um, we tested the lion's share of the ammo we used for testing was this Magtex steel case. We also used uh, Gecko 124 grain, New Republic 124 grain, um, PPU subsonic 158 grain, um, Remington 147 grain subsonics, and uh, the most painful of all was quite a bit of Federal HST. Um, we didn't have any issues until, of course, I buggered up the order. Uh, we didn't really have any issues until we started getting to the end of the lot of the second case of this Magtech um, steel. Um, it felt like the casings themselves were rough, almost sandpaperish, and the the case lips were seemed like they were almost out of spec. We didn't think much of it at the beginning because the guns had been perfectly reliable until that point. Um, and we started having failure to extract issues, kind of similar to when you get a steel case round in an AR-15 and it's all buggered up with carbon and the steel casing fails to expand and the extractor can't pull it out. Um, very similar. We hadn't had any issues at that point. I'm talking the last like 150, 200 rounds is when we finally started having problems with this ammo and this ammo in particular. Because once uh, we started having issues with this ammo, we switched to, uh, that's when we started using the New Republic and 
the gecko more. We did quite a bit of this in the burn down, um, but we started using this a little bit more because we were like, well, maybe it's the ammo. And no failure. No failures with the brass case stuff. Um, there were no failure. We did use aluminum brazer, aluminum brass um, during the burn down, and there were no problems with that either. Um, at first, we thought maybe the guns don't like steel, and I don't like that concept of, oh, if it doesn't like steel, it don't deserve brass. I've, I've run so much steel ammo on my guns in the past that uh, I, I've held that in my mind, like you, you, you gotta be able to run steel. Here's the problem. Um, we loaded this ammo into our MP5 clones. Uh, he has a Zenith ZF5, I have a PTR. I know there's a lot of people out there that are gonna see PTR suck. My PTR's got uh, like 6,000 rounds through it without any problems. I literally, 6,000 rounds, no issues, um, except for this. This was the first ammo that ever gave me any problems, and it was specifically in that lot that was giving us problems in these 2011s. Neither of these guns have problems. They're great, and they had problems with this ammo. So we uh, stopped and switched full time to um, brass new, case, brass case, new brass case, new Republic, and Gecko. Not because of a problem with steel case, but we think that this lot of ammo was pretty bad. We had issues with guns that didn't have any issues um, at that point. Um, and, Other th and we ran 100 rounds of brass flawlessly right after that with not a single issue where we had multiple failures out of one case of ammo. And our second half of the evaluation wasn't, it wasn't slow fire. Um, most of my drills that I shoot usually on my own, of course the current range that we're using doesn't have as much space as the range we used to, that we used to film on. Um, so most of my training is going to be doubles or B8s, and I shot mostly doubles. We did shoot a little bit of B8 to, uh, to zero the guns with. Shot doubles with brass case, and there are no problems. I usually, I was used shooting mostly doubles with uh, the Magtech steel case for the vast majority of the shooting. So um, there's a lot of that ammo, it's bad. Uh, we went looking through the boxes themselves and looked at each, not each individual round. But we went through the individual boxes and checked the ammo and all of it, the rest of it at the bottom of that case feels very different from the stuff that we were shooting before, which felt slick, smooth, and not any different than, um, you know, your usual coated, like, federal HST type of stuff. It felt, it felt nice. We didn't have a problem with it until we did. All the subsonic ammunition we fired, not a single hiccup. Um, fired a mag or two out of the Mac. Just because, just to see if it would have an issue with low powder. Just in case. Um, also flat nose, like the Remington. The Remington stuff is... Encapsulated. I think it's... And it is a flat nose. Flat, flat nose. Open this guy up. Yeah, they're flat nosed. The, game, the gun didn't have any, any problems with the flat nose nope. stuff. And it was all just a test to make sure everything would be working fine. So 115, 124, 147, 158. Not a problem. Different bullet shapes, not a problem. HST. Oh, we did shoot some uh, Hornady out of it as well. No issues. Some Sig Sauer uh, 124 grain uh, GHP. Again, no issues. Gold dot, 147 gold. grain. 147 gold dot. No issues. All personal defense seems to feed out of these great. It worked fine. There were no problems. Um, so yeah, uh, in terms of reliability, provided that you don't have a bad lot of ammo, um, you're gonna be okay. So they both shot extremely well. Um, I'll say that the recoil on the Mac 9 is a little sharper and faster than the Night Stalker. Um, I can say it's akin to comparing like a Glock 17 to a Glock 34, where if you shot a lot of Glocks, you know that the 17 and to s the 17 and the 19 have some very similar slide properties where they're very fast and sharp. Um, which is great for optics, um, but the the feeling was a little bit more initially out of the box and during the burn down, it was a little rougher. Um, not rougher, I should say. It was just more sharp. The Night Stalker was very lazy and slow. It did sort of like this thing when you're shooting it. It does this thing where you, it recoils and then it comes back down and dips a little bit, almost like a Glock 34, where it's got that sort of like comical almost. Um, it's not necessarily bad. Um, I would say that the and this was they've broken in too. Shooting the thousandth round versus shooting the first round, it has broken in considerably. Yeah, and well, the the way they shoot now is a little different from when they first started. It seems like everything starts to wear in a little bit more, and it this dips less, 
and the the Mac 9 didn't quite dip as much on um, returning to zero as the Night Stalker did, but because it was so sharp, that initial recoiling, if your grip wasn't on par, and of course my grip wasn't perfect, I was, during the burn down, like I'm mag dumping and I'm testing to see what happens if I, you know, loosen a little bit here, or if I get lazy here, I position my hand a little bit differently here and see what happens. And if you weren't pretty much on the money in the, in the initial break in with this, you get a lot more lateral movement of the dot. So the gun would come down and you'd have a little bit like that or a little bit like this. And it wasn't one side or the other. And it was just, if your grip wasn't perfect, then you wouldn't necessarily pay for it because you'd still have the dot in the window. But it was a little more pronounced. Whereas with the Night Stalker, you would most most definitely see the dot go whoop, 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 and do the line, the red line that you get with like a Glock 34. If you ever shot a 34 in carry optics and you're shooting fast and you get that that's pretty much what this was like in the beginning. Now that being said, once once they wore in, um, this because the the window on the in the EPS is, eh, I'd say, a smidge smaller than the RMR. You would get some lift and you'd lose the dot a little bit, but it came back to zero so fast that it wasn't necessarily an issue. Um, the Mac 9, after wearing in and really getting used to it, and like after the burn down, and I'm just shooting the gun how I normally shoot, just consistently every time, um, the dot was not leaving the window. I believe that that bull barrel makes a big difference, as well, of course, having an X300 on the bottom of both of these guns makes always makes a difference. Don't let anybody fool you otherwise. Having a light makes a difference for recoil. But uh, it seems like the bull barrel did help with stopping the dot from leaving the window. It felt it didn't feel like a compensated gun, but I've shot plenty of compensated guns where the dot just simply goes meh, 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 and this would move, but you'd see it hit the top of the window and then come back down, top of the window and come back down, top of the window and come back down. And it was a very pleasant, pleasant experience for both of them. Um, in my experience, this was like playing Pong with the top of the window and the bottom of the window as I'd shoot it. You'd watch it hit the top, and it might veer to a side or veer left, but then it'd come right back down onto point and back up. And that was my experience shooting the Mac over the Night Stalker. The Night Stalker, I started to notice my wrist, because I have a little more arthritis from working with my hands too much, it, so I, I would... I would start to lose the dot on the dip down because of the loss of my wrist. It, the initial shots, it was great. It was fantastic. That was just because I'm fatiguing and I need to work on some more strength training with that. So, um, But yeah, overall, both guns, um, the shooting experience is very pleasant. Final opinions. Um... I think that these guns meet the expectation of a production 1911, whether it's double stack or not. Um, if you're buying a production gun that, you know, mass produced out of a factory, not custom built, not hand fit, um, machine fit, because these guns are machine fit, um, I believe that they meet every expectation that you would have from a gun like that. Um, they're fair priced. They're not cheap. I'm never going to say that something like this is inexpensive. Anything that's over... I guess like what six seven hundred bucks. This I guess it's seven hundred dollars now. We used to say that it was the sub five hundred dollar shooter was what we were shooting for. Now that's seven hundred dollars. Yeah, and but. like anything above that is not considered. I'm not going to say that's cheap. Like I have a, I'm not so out of touch as some of other people on on, on YouTube and in the gun community. Where if you're not spending seven thousand dollars on an Atlas Athena, like oh, oh you you must be poor. That's 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 not realistic and it's not tenable. Um, these guns are, as I said, they're fair, they're fair priced, well built with no MIM parts, forged slides and forged frames, steel, not aluminum. Uh, the Gerson 2311 is aluminum, by the way, for $1,000, $1,000 and it's an aluminum gun. Uh, and it's not custom built and it sucks. Um, but that's why we were actually very apprehensive when receiving these guns because um, our experience with the with, with the TSOS single stacks was wonderful. They were all great guns. They were a lot of fun to shoot. Um, they were reliable, um, not picky with ammo. Um, and all the feedback on the Gerson single stacks was the same. 
Um, everybody said that they were they were great guns for the money. Like they're not, you know, temper your expectations. It's not like a Wilson Combat. Uh, it's not a Springfield operator. <laughs> Springfield. <laughs> Sprongfeld. Um, it's not that. So temper your expectations. So I got the, we got this Gerson 2311 in. We filmed very little footage with it because, quite frankly, the gun didn't work. Um, so we were extremely apprehensive for uh, these, and we got them. And um, quite frankly, they're great. Um, and really, there's no excuses for um, building a double stack and doing it cheaply. Um, the ignition parts and the slide stop, the barrels, depending, depending of course, if you're using a barrel, uh, a bushing or a, um, a bull barrel, a bushing gun, really, there's no excuses. There's no excuses for having a poorly built 2011 if you have a company that builds 1911s. Um, the parts commonality is almost exact. Um, the barrels are the same. You can you can swap the barrel and slide from this gun onto a single stack Night Stalker of the same caliber and it will work. Um, should, in theory, allegedly. TSOF says it works. I haven't tried it yet. I'd like to. Um, send me a 9mm single stack TSOF and I'll try it out. We'll see what happens. Um, but There's no reason that these guns need to be need to be poor quality. Um, we know you know who I'm talking about when I say other than Gerson when I say poor quality. Uh, the Springfield Prodigy came out to a whole ton of marketing and it turned out that it was a dud. Um, you got to send it back to Springfield how many times to get it to work right, or send it to Joe Chambers and spend another thousand dollars. And at that point, you could have bought a staccato. Um, there's no reason for that especially since Springfield makes single stacks that work. The parts are almost exactly the same. Um, if you can build it, the ignition parts are, are exactly the same, except for the, the, the trigger bow. Um, really, these guns, quite frankly, in my opinion, shouldn't cost more than three to $500 more than the equivalent single stack. And that's evident when you go buy a custom gun any of the custom builders, like Alchemy, Nighthawk, if they have the option for a double stack, it's five to seven hundred dollars more. So I'm having a tough time understanding why some other companies that don't build single stacks build them for so much more money when they're really you're not really getting more for your money. The 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 pricing on the double stack 1911 market is criminal. Um, I don't think it's really acceptable. Like that might be my opinion. Maybe I'm I'm talking talking out of out of pocket. I guess, but uh, quite frankly, from what I know about 1911s, and I've been a 1911 shooter my entire life, um, knowing that double stacks are almost identical in terms of parts list, there's no excuses for this. Um, these guns are great. They run great. Um, I can't recommend them enough. I don't. Again, I don't know about the duty and the carry model of T sauce. I can't speak on those. The Mac and the T sauce Night Stalker. Highly recommend them. Um, that said, if you're on the fence, again, I can give a resigning recommendation. Just go ahead and grab one if you've got the money. If it's if it's if it's you want one, you really want a double stack 1911. You don't want to pay, you know, almost three thousand dollars for a bog standard gun that's mass produced. Then give these a shot. At this at this point, if any of us gets a different 2011, it's going to be a custom built gun. Like. Alchemy, please send me one for free. I know you're not going to, but the Quantico high cap is the best looking gun I've ever seen in my life. Okay, that's all. Anything else? No, I think we're, we're good. good. Okay, bye. Time to start drinking. Yep. <laughs>